Muy bien, estamos listos para comenzar. Everything is set. So, demos la bienvenida en el escenario a nuestros panelistas para la mesa redonda. Bienestar para la gente dentro de los límites del planeta. Let's welcome to the stage our panelists for the round table people's well-being within the planet's boundaries. Como oradores oponentes, tenemos nuevamente al presidente y director ejecutivo del Fondo Mundial para la Vida Salvaje de Canadá. We have World Wildlife Fund CEO in Canada, Mr. David Miller. <laughs> Investigadora y asesora de políticas para Oxfam UK. Oxfam, Oxfam UK Global Research and Policy Advisor, Catherine Tribeck. Académica de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, Professor at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, Julia Carabias. <laughs> Directora de Economía en el Instituto de Recursos Mundiales, Director of Economics, World Resources Institute, Helen Mountford. Oficial del Programa de Política Científica del Programa de Naciones Unidas para el Medio Ambiente, Science Policy Program Officer, UNEP, Francesco Gaetani. As moderator, we have the Director General of Eurostat, Walter Rademacher. Please go ahead. Comenzamos. Ladies and gentlemen, um, you have heard in the keynote speech today that we are moving slowly from well-being today to also preserving well-being tomorrow and elsewhere. There is a saying in my country which goes a little bit like, uh, I can solve any kind of problem as long it, as it appears only next year. And this is a little bit um, the uh, subject of the discussion uh, in our panel, uh, that we have to deal uh, with uh, questions which are global by nature and not necessarily local from the very beginning. And uh, they um, lead us also to um, questions of how can we um, increase the well-being today Uh, without jeopardizing uh, the well-being of tomorrow. And this is what is called sustainable development. The most recent um, discussion in, in this area is uh, dealing with two catchwords. The first catchword is resilience, and the second catchword is risk. So we have to deal with risks or even uncertainties uh, while looking at the resilience of systems. And we have heard Professor Sarukan um, talking about the resilience of ecosystems and bio biodiversity. Now, I hope that my presentation works. Does not? Ah, here it is. Okay. Um, oops. Yes, but I wanted to go ahead now. Okay, um, so we have planetary boundaries in front of us, and this is a nice scheme of the St uh, Stockholm Resilience Institute. And what is remarkable here is that um, <coughs> climate change is not the only planetary boundary which is seen as um, at risk. It is, in particular, uh, biodiversity and a couple of others. So there are many... Um, obstacles for, let's say, or many challenges uh, for the uh, well-being and the development agenda if we do not want to jeopardize the future. However, um, I think it is very important uh, that we bear in mind that the um, resilience of the planetary boundaries as such are not that interesting for us because there are animals that will survive, even if we are in beyond the point of 
resilience, the planet will survive, some rats will survive, and some cucarachas will survive. But the question is whether we survive. In that sense, I think the motto of this session, living well within the limits of the uh, planetary boundaries, is the right view. So we have to take an anthropocentric uh, view and to understand how we, in a very selfish way, uh, keep the nature intact and uh, respect the planetary boundaries. This is um, a very simple explanation um, from our colleagues in the environmental agency, in, in European Environmental Agency in Copenhagen, and it puts together two high aggregated indicators. Uh, the first high ag aggregated indicator is, uh, is the Human Development Index, and the second is the ecological footprint. What you can see here is that there is a kind of um, solution space in green on the, let's say, uh, southwest side. And this green solution space is what we would like to achieve, namely um, develop all the countries on the lower left side, but not doing it in the same way as the industrialized countries did, namely firstly to develop and then to see oops, we have a kind of problem created that we afterwards now have to solve. So we need to understand what is the good development path um, which avoids the problems of the industrialized world. So, as I said, uh, we need to take into account the concept of resilience, resilience of ecosystems, resilience of the social and economic systems as well, and we have to understand risks what does it mean if something is happening potentially only 20 years from now or 50 years from now? For the round table, um, I have thought it's good to order a little bit the questions in a sequence which follows the motto of the uh, conference, namely statistics, knowledge and policy. The first two questions are dealing with more or less the understanding of the subject, uh, what kind of problems do we have to solve? And then we will go to the more statistical questions. At the end, we will come to policy making. Um, and I would like to invite now um, Catherine as the first uh, speaker, um, having an introduction, focusing on the first, maybe first and second question. Catherine. Great. So good morning, and thanks to the OECD for inviting me here, and thanks to you all for coming along this morning. I want to focus on quality and distribution of growth rather than just its quantity, but I want to do so using the medium of a donut or a bagel uh, or a lifesaver, however you want to think about it, and also a community project in South Africa. And because participation is really important to me, I've got a little activity for you as the audience to undertake. So those of you who are old school and are using a pen and paper, um, I want you to draw on that a circle, about probably the size of a grapefruit, perhaps. And, and those of you who are using laptops, perhaps just look at the outer ring of the, the conference logo. And this, this circle that hopefully you've been able to draw represents this finite planet that Walter was just talking about. The various dimensions are made up of these elements of planetary boundaries that the Stockholm Resilience Center has identified. That's a boundary that the Earth system scientists at the Stockholm Resilience Center say that if we cross them, we're starting to enter a space of unpredictable change and disruption, a space where there's unpredictable feedback loops and nonlinear change, and it's going to be really dangerous. And there are things like ocean acidification, climate change, ozone depletion, land use change, fresh water use. Clearly, this is not a topic that's unfamiliar from, from those of you here today. And as, as Walter said, in January, the Stockholm Resilience Centre updated their research, and they reported that four of those nine planetary boundaries have already been crossed as a result of human activity. Climate change, the loss of biosphere integrity, so biodiversity, land system change, and the alteration of the phosphorus and the nitrogen cycle. And so Oxfam, where I work, although we're not an environmental organization, when we looked at this analysis, it completely and immediately made sense. Because what we see with our work around the world is that all this progress 
to reducing poverty over the last few decades is at risk from climate change and other environmental disruption. But we put people at the heart of everything we do. So I want you to get out your pens again and do as my colleague Kate Rayworth did. Inside that outer layer, draw a smaller circle, maybe about the size of a lime that you put in with your tequila or an apricot, and or think about the inner ring of that conference logo. And this, for us, is a social foundation. It's a minimum below which it's unjust and immoral to allow our fellow human beings to fall below. And I don't think the dimensions of that necessarily need to be prescribed top down by experts. What we need is to reflect on what people and communities say is important for them, what they need to live well, what's most relevant for them. But through various community consultations that I've been involved in and various third party ones that I've, that I've been working through, I think you can be pretty sure that the dimensions of that social foundation are going to include things like access to energy, adequate income, health, shelter, education, and voice. And of course, inequality across all of those. And what's really compelling about this donut or this bagel or this lifesaver that you have just drawn is that it sets out, I think, beautifully <coughs> simply, a new vision for the economy. Because we need an economy that operates below those planetary boundaries, but at the same time lifts people above a social foundation. Because in that space, inside the donut, it's where it's safe and also where it's just. And we need loads of shifts to get us in there to live good lives sustainably. But what's really key is that the donut positions the economy as the servant rather than the master. And often we know it's a pretty ineffective and recalcitrant servant as that. But it, it positions the economy as a servant of our real purpose of good lives on a healthy planet. So I just want to really quickly illustrate what I mean by that, by a project out that took place in a place called Springs, which is about an hour's drive out of Johannesburg. And here there are a group of women that Oxfam had been working with around climate change. And they said to us, look, Oxfam, all those policy papers that you do, all those conferences, all those protests, they're fine and they're great, and it's all well and good, but climate change is impacting our community right now. And so we need to develop ways to feed our families tomorrow. And so what came out of that clarion call was at a local school, and actually it was a school that had been scheduled for demolition because of insufficient pupil numbers, but they had just recruited this wonderful new head teacher who wore these bright blue suits, and he said his style of leadership was to be a doormat rather than on top. And it was at this school where change happened. And so Oxfam secured a bit of money from the European Commission, and we installed high-tech biomass energy generators in the school's kitchen. We put solar panels on the school's roof, and we planted less thirsty vegetables in the school's vegetable patch. And local people are so supportive of this project that they voluntarily act as guards. The school hasn't been vandalized once. And in March, I attended this huge launch celebration. There was three hours of song, of dance, of speeches, of the pupils performing dance to, to show those high-level folk in the audience how to live sustainably. And why I think this, this little vignette is relevant to getting inside the donut, or the bagel, or the life ring, whatever you want to call it, is because not one of those activities at the school was driven by the purpose of increasing GDP, and yet it happened, and it was brilliant. It was a tiny, tiny example of climate justice, with funds coming from the global north, flowing to lower income countries that are affected by climate change, climate change caused by rich consumers, so let's not let ourselves off the hook. It included technology transfer, and maybe even a bit of leapfrogging into a more sustainable way of living. It was locally led, it was a community's initiation. It was their terms. Experts were on tap, but they weren't on top. It worked with the grain of nature, just as we've been hearing in the previous session, using agroecology methods, small-scale local provisioning, rather than seeing nature as a source of resources and just then a sink that we can put in. Young people were showing the influentials how to make change, and they did so with song and dance, and I think that was a really beautiful way of saying, or starting to reimagine what a good life is about that's not just about consumerism. And I think this is really key. The whole project had women at the forefront, 
You know, it was women who had an eye to the immediate needs of their community, and simultaneously, it was the women who were focusing on system change. So these are tiny examples of how we can get inside the donut, uh, but it's the donut that demands that we really focus first and foremost on those true fundamental human needs and work from there. That's always our starting point. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. Um, so this leads immediately to David, or maybe the other panelist would have a short uh, comment on Helen's, uh, uh, on Catherine's statement. Otherwise, um, I think we could continue with David. Well, uh, thank you very much. And I think what Catherine said. Uh, Gracias. Lo que dicho. The community being engaged leads very well to this next question, what are the main links between well-being and planetary boundaries? And I'll speak a little bit both uh, from my experience running the World Wildlife Fund in Canada and also from my experience as, as mayor of Toronto, because I think you see these issues both in dealing with nature and in building some of the world's great cities. Um, and I, I think also it's critically important that collectively, uh, we think about these issues together. We think about the economy. When we think about the economy, we're also thinking about social justice and inclusion and prosperity for all. When we think about social justice, inclusion and prosperity for all, we're also thinking about the environment because they're linked. Uh, and when we think about the environment, we think about the economy and inclusion. And I, I'll give some examples of why and perhaps a, a little bit at the end about solutions. But the, the first example is one in Canada of showing the link between environmental sustainability, community well-being and, and social justice, and economic stability. And that's the cod fishery uh, off Newfoundland. Uh, for those of you who don't know Newfoundland, it's a province in eastern Canada, uh, first uh, settled actually by the Vikings and then settled again uh, by Aboriginal people and then by Europeans starting in the 1400s. When the Europeans came to Newfoundland, they wrote in their diaries, the sailors wrote in their diaries that they got off their ships and walked across the backs of codfish to the land. Now, I have never seen fishermen walk on water myself. Uh, I'll leave that for others, but it does illustrate the richness of this environmental resource. It was an incredible richness. And it sustained economic and social life in the province of Newfoundland for 400 years until 1992. And in 1992, the cod fishery was closed. And it was closed because we had not paid attention to planetary boundaries, to nature and the environment. We only thought about economic policy with the fishery. We thought about how much can we extract. And in fact, if you look at the extraction of the cod fishery to feed human beings uh, for 400 years, it went like this, and then the last 20 went like this. Mm -hmm. And that was not sustainable. What was the consequence of this collapse? Well, the consequence was devastating economically. 40,000 people lost their work uh, within a month of the fishery being closed. And by the way, that was 1992, it is still not open today. It is still not open. And most of those people lived in very small fishing communities in the outports of Newfoundland. So there was an incredible social and societal impact of the fact that we paid attention to economic issues, but not environmental issues. So the issues from my perspective are inextricably linked. When we think about nature, we have to think about the economy and social justice. The same thing in how we build our cities. For a very long time, we thought about cities as a way to, to build and to grow, and we're very excited, and we paved parking lots and, and built new buildings that at the, the best prices um, and the latest construction techniques. But we did not think about, in all of those policies, the connection to the environment. We may have thought about the connection to the economy and jobs. We may even in some progressive places have thought about social inclusion, but we rarely thought about connections to the environment. And we are now seeing in cities, in many cities around the world, 
I suspect Mexico City, certainly Toronto, the urban areas are so built up that the temperature is much higher on hot summer days. And we therefore use more carbon intensive ways of energy to cool buildings. And we have a negative loop uh, reinforcing climate change because of the way we built our cities. So if we look at these two examples, we can see the very direct connection between our thinking about the economy, our thinking about the environment, and our thinking about social inclusion. And I want to give two examples about how we do this positively to get things right. The first is with the cod fishery. The World Wildlife Fund Canada, we're working with uh, the fishing industry in Newfoundland. We've signed an agreement with the Fish Workers Union, Fish Harvesters Union, uh, and with some fish processors and the government in order, as the cod start to show signs of recovery, nearly 25 years later, 25 years, they're starting to show signs that nature is coming back to change the fishing practices and the industry so they're based on principles of sustainability. And by starting with sustainability, we may not bring back 40,000 jobs, but we might bring back 25,000 jobs. And those jobs will all be in these very small villages that were entirely reliant on the cod fishery for human sustenance and for their economy. So by starting with environmental policy, we're going to have a positive economic impact, and that prosperity will be a shared prosperity amongst people desperately in need. And the same thing with cities. In the city of Toronto, for example, there is a project called Tower Renewal to take apartment buildings which were built entirely out of concrete in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, and they were built as a housing and economic strategy. But because they were built from concrete, they have no insulating power whatsoever. Huge wasters of energy. Oh, and by the way, the impact of climate change on cities uh, is very severe. Toronto, uh, in my second term as mayor, within four years, we had three storms, each one of which should only happen once every 50 years. So we had three 50-year storms in four years, hundreds of millions of dollars of damage. And we were making climate change worse because our buildings weren't built properly to the highest standards. So we have a program to retrofit those buildings to have a dramatic decrease in greenhouse gas emissions from Toronto. We'll create better buildings for people to live in that are more efficient and over time run at a lower cost. And many of those buildings are in low-income neighborhoods. So as part of the thinking, because the environmental strategy was integrated with economic and social thinking, a job creation program was created for young people in those neighborhoods to do the work on the buildings. And I give those two examples because they address to me very clear examples of the linkages between environmental sustainability, economic sustainability, and prosperity for all. And we can see what happened from what happened in Newfoundland where communities literally uh, were closed in some cases because of the collapse of the environment, that if we get this process right, we can support an economy that supports everybody, and it's based on nature. And the same thing in our cities if we integrate that thinking. And I, I think uh, those are my comments, Walter. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, indeed. It's um, now time to ask the question, how, what kind of information do we need in order to improve the decision-making process? And what are the conditions um, under which better information leads to better, no, that does not work any longer, um, <coughs> leads to, to better uh, decisions? And I think, um, we have to recognize now, this is question three, um, that um, sometimes um, we have observed in the past that better information has not led to better decisions. And uh, maybe the long procedure under the climate change negotiations is a good example. Uh, the current refugee crisis in Europe is another example. So uh, it, it was not that difficult to see it coming. Uh, but it's a kind of tendency to wait until the last minute until crisis happens. Um, and the question is, what are the conditions um, to make inf better information really to lead to better decisions? Is it 
education? Is it literacy? Is it overcoming um, of, let's say, uh, political opportunity, mainstream way of thinking? Uh, so uh, the next speaker uh, dealing with this is Helen. Thank Please you very much, Walter. Um, we have to acknowledge, I think, that policymakers, businesses, investors, consumers are making choices every day without full information, with some uncertainty. And the challenge is how do you get sufficient information of the right type at the right time to make a decision? And in order to make a decision before it is too late, before we lock in pathways which later we won't be able to shift from. And I think this is partly the case on climate change, as you have mentioned and others have. Catherine mentioned climate change is one of the boundaries where we've already gone too far. Um, as David noted, in Toronto, we have seen huge storms of the magnitude, which were very unusual. In Mexico here, we have seen the same. So this is one of the challenges. On climate change, it is certainly the case that a number of policymakers, a number of people from the public, from businesses, delayed too long, waiting for better and more and more information, more certainty, before taking some of the policy decisions that could have shifted us onto a better track. So the challenge is really bringing the right information to the table at the right time in order to be able to make a reasonable decision. And one of the things I think that is key here is that the information that we need is not always the most obvious. It is not always that we need the exact information we're first looking for, but perhaps information around the sides, whether it's about the social impacts, the economic impacts, the benefits, the alternatives. And the question is how to look for that. Let me give one example here, and that is about fossil fuel subsidies and the data and the information that have come to light over the last uh, six to seven years, which have helped us to make reforms which were not possible before. So back in 2009, the G20 summit agreed in Pittsburgh to reform, to phase out fossil fuel subsidies that are inefficient over the medium term. That was an agreement, it was partly based on some data which was actually produced by colleagues from the OECD, my former colleagues there, and from the IEA, which showed very clearly that putting in place fossil fuel subsidy reform could actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions by about 10% by 2050. So a notable change in greenhouse gas emissions. But again, back in 2009, very many politicians, very many analysts were wondering about whether the costs and the benefits of action on climate change were actually making making it worthwhile to move ahead. So this was stuck in the mire of discussions behind closed doors in many countries on whether to act, whether not to act, what to do, what not to do. It was stuck there. More recently, we've seen a dramatic shift. We now have 28 countries that have put in place fossil fuel subsidy reforms or accelerated them in the last two years alone. Now, part of this is because we've got low oil prices, which makes it more palatable, more acceptable to the public to put these reforms in place. But part of it is actually because of the range of data points and, and information that have become available over the last five years or so. So this includes a number of points, and I'll, I'll mention a few of these. First of all, back in 2009, when the, the leaders made their statements, um, there was quite a bit of data available on the subsidies to consumption in developing and emerging economies, but no consolidated data on fossil fuel subsidies in OECD and developed countries. This was clearly an imbalance, and politically, it made it very hard to, to have movement and progress forward because of this imbalance in data. So the OECD the OECD uh, decided to pull that data together and in 2013, for the first time ever, released an inventory of tax breaks and subsidies in OECD countries. So it became transparent, it became the information was out, it became more available for everybody to see, for the public, for decision makers, uh, for analysts. And it became clear that in many cases these subsidies were very large. And let me just take one example, and that's Mexico. In Mexico, um, in 2011, there were something like the order of $16 billion of subsidies to fossil fuel consumption. So this information became available. Moreover, not just in Mexico, in many countries around the world, there started to be analyses which compared these subsidies to other government expenditures. So for example, showing that in a number of countries, the subsidies were larger than what was spent in total by the government on education and health. 
this was a shock to many and became publicly aware. Second, for a number of countries, reforms have been hampered because there is a fear that it would actually impact negatively on low-income households. This was something that was discussed often. It was used as, as a reason to slow reforms, not to make progress. But then again, people started to collect the data, started to analyze it, to look at what were the actual impacts. So again, in Mexico, for example, it became clear that over 55% of the fuel subsidies actually benefited the top 20% of the population. It was the rich who captured the most of the subsidies. Not surprisingly, the very poorest actually can't afford cars, so they're not benefiting the same as those who can afford the cars, the large houses, the electric equipment, etc. And it's even worse in the agricultural area, where electricity subsidies for pumping irrigation water were even more regressive. 80% of these electricity subsidies for irrigation go to just the 10% richest farmers. So that's really the large industrial farms uh, were benefiting by far the most. And it was this sort of information that as it started to come forward, started to generate public support for action, started to show a way forward in terms of putting in place reforms which could actually help the poor, uh, could benefit the poor, and could lead to better economic outcomes, better fiscal outcomes, uh, revenues which the government could use for other purposes, and of course, much better environmental and greenhouse gas emission um, uh, results, reductions from those. So it was this type of evidence that came to light and led Mexico and 27 other countries to make more serious reforms on fossil fuel subsidies in the last couple of years. Now, it raised the political awareness, it raised the public awareness, but any of these specific data points on their own would not have been enough for action. Any of these specific data po points have uncertainties, um, uh, information loss, uh, information uncertainties around them, but it's the combination of the data points, it's the combination of the perspective looking across the economic, the social uh, impacts, and the environmental, which is what actually enabled progress to take place. And I think this is one of the things which builds on what David has said, what Catherine has said. It's the combination how we look at economic, social, environmental together, uh, make a thorough assessment, draw together what data we can. It's not going to be perfect, but it's got to be enough to make the decisions at the right, right point in time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. That's um, an invitation to implement a system of environmental economic accounts. Um, because then, once you have implemented it uh, in principle, you should have uh, the information about subsidies, taxes, jobs, material flows, linked to activities, and so forth and so forth. So in theory, we know what needs to be done uh, in statistics. Uh, but the question is where to set the priorities um, and what should be measured first, in particular also in the light of the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and this leads to uh, the next uh, speaker, Francesco. Yes, thank you very much, Walter. Uh, well, indeed, from a more technical perspective, uh, from a perspective, uh, I would say, uh, from a data provider or information provider perspective, uh, the main uh, challenge in uh, in uh, informing policies supporting uh, human well-being uh, within planetary boundaries are very much uh, related to the concept of integrated uh, approach, which is, by the way, also uh, underpinning the overall construct of the 2013 Agenda on Sustainable Development. The notion of integration, uh, indeed, is, uh, is quite difficult, especially from, uh, from a data perspective because uh, its implementation requires uh, a very close interaction of the three main dimensions that are underpinning the sustainable uh, agenda. In the same notion, from an environmental perspective, we have distilled the very, very different frameworks and conceptual approaches, like, for instance, uh, the Millennium Declaration back in 2000, uh, the World Summit on Sustainable Development in 2002, and uh, lastly, the Rio Plus 20, Convention in 2020, uh, 2012. <clears throat> sorry. Such an integrated approach, uh, especially from an environmental uh, perspective, uh, should include at least three main uh, frameworks, which are 
uh, relevant to the, to the concept of uh, leave no one behind, uh, which is very much related to, to the social and the environmental protection. Uh, we have in the, same, uh, in the same concept uh, the promotion of the green economy uh, towards... Uh, Oh, I can't switch. Yeah, maybe you take the mic. Oh. Okay, now I have two micro, and I don't know if it, it is better. Okay, very good. So, just to recap, the main challenge in in uh, informing yeah, policies okay, but his mic is, uh... that are focusing on uh, on uh, human well-being in uh, within planetary boundaries are related to the concept of integrated approach. From an environmental perspective, in particular, the, the uh, challenge is to uh, consider three main dimensions that are underpinning this, uh, this concept. This does not work. The concept of uh, inclusiveness, or uh, leave no one behind, which is very much relevant okay, to the social okay. and the environmental protection. The, the concept of the promotion of the green economy, towards a sustainable consumption and production society, and uh, the commitment of, of governments uh, to increase the natural, the social, and the economic capitals to achieve resilience and to secure future generation livelihoods. From uh, a UN perspective, uh, we are uh, working uh, on this theme since uh, many years in, in a close cooperation with governments and uh, international organizations. In particular, we are focusing our attention on uh, building data infrastructures that are quite critical and instrumental to share information, to provide uh, information and data to the, to the citizens and to the, uh, to the decision makers. We are very much uh, advocating the concept of uh, open data, and uh, we are supporting governments that are promoting uh, policies that are uh, uh, providing full and open access to data and information. And uh, in, this, in this specific uh, topic, uh, what UNEP, the United Nations Environmental Program, is doing uh, since 2014 is providing an open platform, which is a UNEP Life, which is a, a, a knowledge platform uh, that is at the disposal of governments to share data and to provide access to data on the environment, uh, not only geospatial data, but also data related to the legislations, the, the regulation, the, the, the legal frameworks that are relevant to the environment in the different countries. The um, UNEP Life portal uh, very recently actually includes uh, now an SDG portal, which is quite interesting and I think quite useful uh, because uh, it provides a, a visual, a graphical representation of the different goals and uh, the interlinkages between the different targets and uh, uh, in the near future, uh, the different indicators that are informing the, 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 the targets. We are also working uh, uh, very hard on the um, development of ontologies, which in our opinion are quite important and critical to support the implementation of such policies. Uh, ontologies are, uh, just to give you an idea, are a sort of vocabulary where the objects or the, the definition and terms that are contained in, in this, uh, in this uh, set have some uh, uh, causal relationship. So for instance, you can have an ontology on hydrology, an ontology on biodiversity, or an ontology on agriculture. And the idea here is to help these different communities that are used to work in isolation to uh, develop, for instance, uh, multidimensional uh, indicators or common indicators. And again, here, the main challenge is to measure and uh, to give a, a very precise definition of concepts that are uh, included, for instance, in, in the ESDG uh, framework, just approved, that are related to the access uh, or to build, and ensure, promote something, which are very difficult to translate in, in data or, or in measurable parameters or variables. 
But uh, the main important, the most important point here, I think, uh, is the co-production of data and information. In this case, what we are uh, uh, doing in, in close cooperation with governments is to uh, try to develop uh, data and to uh, add value producing information uh, using not only the authoritative source of data, which are uh, typically um, coming from, from governments, from, from offices, uh, departments, units of the governments, but also uh, um, asking other external non-governmental uh, data providers or, uh, or um, institution organizations that are producing data to work with them and to co-produce data and information. This is open also to the citizen, and uh, one main concept here is the concept of citizen science. And uh, in this case, the citizens are not really considered only as consumers of data, but also as providers of data. This is now possible because of the technologies that, uh, that we have, the, the, the technological environment where we live. And it's really very important uh, and critical, especially focusing on uh, real-time data relevant, for instance, to the state of the environment, to the environment in big cities, to the, to, to the quality of the air, to the quality of the water, to the uh, biodiversity. For instance, the issue of heat island that was, was uh, mentioned before is a, is a quite important issue now for, for mega cities. And the idea is to ask citizen provide and fit this, uh, this portal of real-time data, whose frequency and uh, whose, uh, um, and, uh, and whose uh, very local uh, uh, observation are quite critical to construct and to build a, a picture on what is, uh, what is really uh, happening, focusing on the specific phenomena. Then another uh, uh, big subject here I think is the big data uh, because actually it is a, a fact that uh, we are now in the position we have the technology to access such data. The main issue here is to really exploit this data, this set of data and to make this information, to make this data information first of all and to really make this information uh, useful and usable also for, the, for, for citizens. In this case, the main is the computational effort, but there are some very good examples that are now ongoing on, uh, on a distributed processing system or a distributed computing system that could be very helpful in this, uh, in this specific topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francesco. Um, so this brings us to the last uh, part and the last question. I don't know if, it, if I can manage to put it up screen. But in principle, if we imagine we have here the evidence, statistics, research, and here we have the decision making, then uh, the big question in this session is how to bring this together at local, regional, national, and global level. So basically, um, the question is, what kind of information and, and evidence can help the governor of Jalisco to, um, in, in a situation where he is pressed with a lot of day-by-day -day pressing questions, to take into account the biodiversity, to take into account climate change and the planetary boundaries, which are global concepts. What kind of information and in which breakdown at regional and local level can help him to make a better decision for budget allocations and for the building of streets or not building of streets, for protecting agricultural biodiversity, and so forth and so forth. So how can we link these two worlds in a, in a, in a good way together? Examples um, uh, have been mentioned quite a number. But Julia is now in the position to sum up and to give us her examples. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to follow, I'm sorry for my colleagues, 
I'm going to follow the examples of the other panels that um, Mexicans spoke in Spanish, so I'm going to um, take advantage of the translation. So sorry about switching to Spanish with your... Um, one of the first things that I would like to cover is that the challenge before us in order to be able to find once again this space of how to achieve a good level of life, a good life on the or well-being at a planetary levels. We have been discussing so far during these two days that the great challenge is to eliminate poverty, reduce inequalities, have an inclusive, uh, have inclusiveness and achieve it through sustainable development. And now we put it on this context of planetary boundaries. How can we put everything in context of these planetary boundaries? It seems to me that one of the first issues that we have as an obstacle is that the planetary boundaries is not a concept that has obtained consensus and has been adopted by all countries. An experience that we had at the United Nations prior to the Rio Plus 20 summit where the Secretary General gathered a group of persons to make a series of um, questions, this objective that I just said to eliminate poverty and put it on planetary boundaries that was really highlighted did not go beyond the summit because there's a fear to accept that concept. There, there are many visions that have criticized it. It had been said that it is a term that re-edits the growth of the 70, that it is a new way in which the northern country would be limiting sovereignly the natural resources of the countries of the south, but now with the mask of uh, environmental issues. But on the other hand, uh, there is a problem that has been expressed here. We have boundaries on scientific evidence, in spite of the fact that there is a lot of accumulated uh, scientific evidence, maybe on the topics that where we have moved forward. Yes, do we have to do with climate change? Thousands of studies can give you the evidence that this is a fact, a real fact, and that it has been caused by human beings. However, as we have said, we have not fully understood that the problem is that we are taking business as usual to an extreme situation in the use of natural resources that will be reverted. It does not mean that the planet will collapse and that life will stop. Life like we used to know it right now and this society have evolved, have found their space and have adapted. That is what is changing. Therefore, if the change is so big, the Nobel Prize, Paul Crusin has said that we are in the Anthropocene era, and that is the extent of the problem that we face. This is something that is not really fully seen or understood or been incorporated into policies because of several reasons. I do believe that society is not fully aware. We are measuring many things. Mexico has very high institutional high level institutions that are measuring these topics. Um, Neji is one. We see Conavio uh, with that we saw with uh, Jose Sarucan. But really, those are these measures being incorporated into public policies? Are these the topics that are enable us to plan 
the way of development that we want in our country. And David was saying it, Canada does not have an institution like Conavio. I don't know how many countries would have an institution like uh, Inegi. Luis uh, from Colombia said yesterday that they do not have it. So what is going on? Many things are going on. The, the boundaries of the planet is a call uh, for made by scientists to showcase very serious issues that we're living. But public policies are not at the level, to the level of the challenge that we are facing. And they're not to the level of, because of many reasons. Environmental speeches are marginal. Environmental speech is that when it is incorporated, maybe uh, this heads of state, presidents talk about sustainability, but it's still a chapter in the development programs. Environmental issues are not being understood to the extent of the conference that Dr. Sarukan is explaining that has to do with food availability. And it has to, we have been hurting for two years time with a lot of concern by many sectors of how from the sector we are being told that environment will not be an obstacle to grow because you have to grow and you have to create jobs. And when the sec environmental sector is saying that it is not going to be a break for development, it causes panic. We are not incorporating environmental topic transversally. We are leaving it on the residue of the topics that do not affect that much. But if, it, if there's not a policy that can ensure that we, that that nature is our natural capital in order to develop. We will not be eliminating poverty, not reducing inequalities, nor attain sustainable development. So we need to undertake a reengineering process on the institutions. It needs to reengineer public policies. We cannot all agree to the fact that business as usual is not the way out and keep the institutions such as they are at present and keep political priority as we have them today. In previous conference, we had heard how to include environmental topics. All panel members have been talking about sustainable development, but we are not really incorporating environmental issue, it's natural grounds, uh, the planetary boundaries, and that is creating the limits in how we should operate. However, I do believe that we have been advancing, we have been moving forward, and may, but those should be leading us the way through which we have to go through. One of the characteristics of this reengineering of institutions has to do with transversality. It is uh, necessary for sectors to hear environmental sector, uh, food and agriculture sector. Normally, don't speak to each other. They just sometimes discuss a topic, but they don't continue with collective works. There are no structures that they will force them to be transversal. In the kind uh, in, in food production, food production is facing four planetary boundaries, change of land, loss of biodiversity, geochemical climate, excess of nitrogen and phosphorus, and the 
issue of climate change. Environmental sector or the food sector cannot be planning the production of food if it does not take into account these four areas. And these four areas are placed on other sectors, and this is not worked jointly. There is not long-term vision. We are planning uh, immediately vis-a-vis -vis the problems uh, that arise. And with, without a long-term vision, this cannot um, continue. So there are not multi-annual budgets. All these topics depend from people that live in the countryside, at the farms, that are betting to new ways of doing things. And they don't have a security or a certainty that throughout these changes, he will have a better horizon, he will have a better lifestyle, and he will be able to keep his natural base of uh, of income, and he cannot have that guarantee on the long run that decisions will not be made. So these very short-term programs and immediate results cannot allow us to move forward in challenges of this extent. An example of what is really general, where there is evidence, there is science, it is not taken into account. You measure, but it is not taken into account for decisions. Decisions are not transversal. Decisions are not long term. Then which would be the way the examples are showing us that, yes, there is a horizon. Yes, there is ox oxygen. There's a little bit of optimism from which we can work. So. Um, dealing with topics that have to do with a green agenda and that is being put aside when we do talk about climate change, but it is substantial agenda when we're talking about food production, where we're talking about the sovereignty of food. And from this transversality articulation of policies, We are forced to plan and to see the long term. And the land is created by its natural surround, it's com integrated by its natural surrounding and men. So you cannot state just one policy that sees it all. Land has to be decided according to the specific features of that territory that the people that have constructed their lives on that land. Land where you have more biodiversity that is still under good conditions of conservation, which is one of the great problems, uh, losing this biodiversity. We need to avoid from losing that biodiversity. Mexico and other and all of our countries have policies that are, are linked to protect the natural areas. And then those policies hinder from uh, changing the land use. But we can also use other instruments that are from other institutions, like a payment for environmental services. When people receive a benefit for conserving, for preserving, they realize that they are playing a role in avoiding this problem that has to do with this planetary boundaries, so they receive this financial support, and then they have the cost of opportunity, and they don't make that change of land use. Like sustainable uh, forest land, Oaxaca is a state that has proven great uh, advancement in how to do it in economic and environmental success. When ecotourism is well managed with this vision of the farmers doing their own management of their own resources and conserving them, having the income and being the owners of these companies, 
when you make this productive reconversion by reducing the number of fertilizers or fertilizer use or increasing perennials and organic matters on the system, and you restore areas such as the rivers, you connect the areas of uh, forests or natural resources, then you connect them to this alternative ways of using nature. And we have them working in our country. And I do believe that in many other countries, they have also included them within their policies, but they are not being operated, articulated with a specific uh, vision in a specific uh, territorial area. So I think that's the leap that we are missing. We need to put it transversally to articulate all these instruments and try to work directly with people. And I think that is one of the other links that we are missing on policies. Research has been punished. We don't have uh, any research on biodiversity of food. We don't have enough inventories. We don't know how many species we have in our countries uh, when you have this huge biodiversity. Uh, and there are very important limits on this educational policies and in research in order to foster many of these topics. And there is a fear at the government to work with people, to open up, to establish the mechanisms of uh, inf scientific information flow for the decision making. These channels, I would say they are spoiled, but we have not even built them. So there are no channels of information flow from science to the decision making. So there is much more knowledge that we are apply of what we are applying. And this is a moment to enforce it. Otherwise, it could be too late. So I think that we have to rewrite the rules as it had been said the first day. Thank you very much, Julia. Muchisim, muchisimas gracias, Julia. Uh, looking for. I have now got um, a couple of questions, and I think they are also put on the screen. Uh, let me start with one uh, that um, is the most provoking one, uh, and, and then we might open also for uh, the wider audience. And the question is, uh, does better information really equate to behavior change? Can you use statistics to convince a chocolate lover to eat broccoli? So who would like to start? <coughs> David. Uh, well, I think the question answers itself. You cannot use statistics to persuade a chocolate bar to become broccoli. Um, and I, I think the sad truth from the perspective of someone who was uh, involved in government for uh, nearly two decades is information alone is not enough. But we must have the information. I thought some of the examples here were, were very powerful. Uh, um, the fossil, Helen mentioned the fossil fuel subsidies and the amount of them. Very powerful to know that. I think you need three things. You need the information. You need the people engaged to both get the information and also to provide information. Mm -hmm. Because people know things. They understand. They may be focused on tomorrow a little bit too much, but they know. So if you have the information, a fully engaged citizenry, and then leadership. And what I mean by leadership is the best leaders look to the future, not to tomorrow. And if they do that in the right way with an engaged citizenry and proper information, I think you can make tremendous change. But the information alone, no, uh, of course not. OK. Thank you. Who wanted to come in here? Or shall we go to the next question? There are questions here for Helen. Do you think that um, the COP21 in Paris has the potential to bring real change in the coming years? What will its success depend on? Thanks very much. Uh, yes, I do believe that COP21 has the potential. I think we've got very good signs now um, that there's a real potential for a shift 
for COP21 to be a turning point. We have a number of countries that have come forward with very ambitious plans on what they will do uh, to reduce emissions in the coming years. Beyond the countries, I think what we've been seeing over the last year or so is an incredible momentum amongst businesses, amongst bi uh, uh, investors, amongst cities to actually take a lead themselves and to start saying what they're willing to do and how they're going to be moving forward. And I'll give just, just one example of this. We've had over a thousand businesses and investors which have come forward saying we want carbon pricing. If we can have carbon pricing, that gives us a clear, strong signal in how to move forward towards a low carbon economy. It gives us po positive, you know, clear messages, certainty, policy certainty. And beyond that, we've had a number of businesses, quite a few, that have actually started to put carbon pricing in place themselves. And on average, with the, some of the major oil companies around the world, they're putting in place their own internal carbon pricing of about $40 per tonne. So we have action by governments, we have actions by businesses and investors, we have action by citizens and uh, cities. Do we have enough? The answer is no, we still need more. It's very clear that even with all of the um, ambition, all of the targets that have come forward so far, it's not going to be enough to put us on a pathway to keep a global average temperature rise below two degrees Celsius. So we need more. The good news is there's more and more evidence growing from around the world that you can get more climate action and actually better growth whether it's uh, better because we're taking care of poverty, we're reducing some of the social inequalities, better growth, stronger, better growth, and climate action. So based on all this evidence, I'm very much hopeful that in Paris, we will not only agree a strong agreement on, on what countries are doing now, but also the mechanisms for them to come back together in four or five years as the prices of renewables continue to drop, as new innovation comes on board, to come back in four or five years and agree even more action beyond what they've said in December this year. Thank you. So now I try to make it work. It, the next question is displayed, and this is for uh, Julia. Given the context, how can all nations be encouraged to commit to, in, to the environmental agenda? I think it's uh, displayed here. Uh, and then it's the same in Spanish. You can read it here. It's in front of you. Oh, you can. <laughs> well, all countries to commit to the environmental agenda. I think that this is a problem that we've been seeing um, as a great difficulty. And why is that? Well, because commitments that uh, have stemmed and uh, been created at the UN are a lot, are huge. The agenda of the UN has helped a lot to to focus some national uh, policies. And of course, that is one thing that is very, very important. How is it that the global agenda is uh, an, an agenda that uh, then moves towards uh, local, but not necessarily to meet with those international commitments, but is part uh, of sustainable development can be achieved in our country in this way. So when there is no compliance or a meeting of these uh, objectives. Uh, there is an evident erosion of uh, credibility um, of what these four uh, will be able to contribute with. I hope that uh, the COP as 21, as Helen said, I hope it is a step forward. Uh, however, I think that COP21 has taken a an important leap because there has been pressure from society, of course, and I think that the position from the Pope, for example, was something that pushed a little more. Uh, the governments will not do that on their own because there is 
a thing, and that is that it is not short term. And of course, planning is very short plan, uh, short term for these people. They are not committing um, f for people who are not yet voting. And uh, here, what we are talking about are uh, different generations. I mean, we are. We perhaps won't be here by 2030. We do not know. And this uh, planetary exhausting uh, effort is something to which we have been adapting. But there will come a time when these are more catastrophic elements, more catastrophic events, perhaps not on the short term, but we are not paving the way correctly for the long term. So how can we uh, make these uh, uh, commitments to be embraced, I think that society has a significant role. And I'm not seeing a clear uh, society. I'm not seeing a well-organized uh, society, neither at the academ academia nor society. The academia is not setting enough um, steps, is not taking enough steps, is not well or strongly convinced in order to do this. I am not seeing participation spaces between the government and uh, the academia and the uh, society. And if society does not take this in its own hands, and if scientific information that is the best way to make decisions and to um, truly have scientific, scientific information, when this happens, the politician cannot be criticized uh, uh, but he can if he has that information. But since that, in the short term, and since that, with respect to, to votes, is not quite profitable, then it is not incorporated. So we need to uh, have institutions that are highly professional, that are generating information, as I mentioned. I mentioned the three that we have. I mentioned that society needs to assimilate information. I need that it needs to transform this into actions and then demand transparency and accountability in order to meet or to uh, commit to these commitments, uh, because they do not only stem from governments, they stem from deep discussion, from uh, scientific information, and that is what where it can be uh, at its best limit, best level of uh, clarity. But of course, that depends upon society. And I think that the media, of course, play a very important role. And. Uh, I really appreciate what they do. They are not helping, not enough. And therefore, that is a huge responsibility. Very, very quick. I think, uh, again, uh, a key point here is the integration of the different dimensions. And from a data perspective, again, the, the main challenge is to uh, help countries to develop um, uh, a change in a way they uh, provide data and information to, to the decision makers and to the citizens. We have some very good example here in the region, in Mexico and Brazil, where <clears throat> the statistics office is uh, actually uh, in the same institution as the Geography Institute. And this is a very good example. I think uh, there are only three um, uh, example like that in the world, and two out of three are here in this region. It's uh, also a way, it's also, I think, uh, an issue on the way how we communicate this, uh, this issue, the way how citizens are really aware of the uh, effect of climate change, the effect of a non sustainable development on their own life. And um, on this specific topic, I think we we have to um, really engage the society and to ask them to be part of this communication and to provide the authoritative uh, data providers with data and information that could be, that should be included and, uh, and taken into account in, uh, when we consider these, these big issues at regional, uh, local and national level. 
Okay, thank you very much. Now I would like to open the floor for the wider audience, and I've seen already a signal of interest from the lady in the first or second row. So, please hear. Buenos días. Eh, bueno, eh, este comentario va a. This comment goes to Julia. I think that we should not should not underestimate the effort, the collective effort that we do uh, with environmental groups. At least in Jalisco, we have uh, achieved a couple of things. And um, we have done that because I, I know that because I'm part of a member of some of these groups. And together with the government, we've been working. And of course, we have evidence of uh, achievements. And the question is, you were Minister of the Environment, remember, I remember that. And I would like to hear from you what policies and what actions did you achieve in a transversal way? What did you achieve that contributed to these problems that you have mentioned? All the questions on board we need now to be relatively concise and uh, Julia please yeah first of all Jalisco is doing a wonderful effort in terms of the environmental policy i think that uh, the governor of Jalisco is very sensitive he's pushing that forward I am referring, if we go one case at a time, in all states, we have NGOs that are very active. I, I am with one of them. And in all the states, we have different progresses that are being made, uh, some uh, setbacks, of course. But what I'm saying is rather with respect to the need for a quantum leap. We are moving too slowly, and the challenges are huge. And this has to do with uh, decision and with um, greater willingness that will unblock and move uh, through these transversalities. Transversalities are very uh, complex, and they have to do with the design of institutions oftentimes. And regardless the efforts of the minister in Jalisco, for example, if uh, his or her colleagues don't move in that direction, it's hard to move forward. Of course, progress will be made if there is a, the willingness, but they will not be able to be uh, coping with things as necessary. What transversal things? Well, we are talking about 20 years ago when there was uh, no really environmental uh, topics uh, at a governmental level. I mean, this is uh, now uh, something that we hear about, but not before. And the first transversal thing was to create the institution. We brought the natural resources, water, fishery, forestry, and the environment into one institution. And their policies that you very well know uh, started forestry and uh, wildlife and laws and many things. But I don't want to take any more time from the panel to summarize what was done. The bases were set, uh, and all this is yet on on the way. And of course, I don't want to underestimate the efforts made by states that have less uh, budget, by the way. And these are setbacks, of course. And I uh, can believe that the federation cannot is not giving these type of resources for 
uh, green agendas. And that is what I mean when I talk about quantum leaps. I'm talking about commitment. I'm talking about global objectives and uh, national agendas articulating all of this. Three, and uh, first the lady here in the third, and then we come to the two gentlemen. Thank you. Good morning. Azucena Galinda from Mexico. First of all, I want to congratulate Dr. Sarukan, all the panel members. And Dr. Rakarabia has just said it when she said so strongly how important is willingness. Mr. Willing said that you need to inform civil society leadership for a very strong and sound willingness in this forum about economy, you also have to deal with environmental. I am more on the educational side. I think that on educational forums, they should be covering environmental issues because I think that's where we have to start. That is what I wanted to comment on. Yes, it is from a media period, this journalism without censure. Oh, I, it called my attention, and I could really be, be doing a very attractive uh, piece of information. And to that remark, I would say, how many years do you think that we can see the change, if any? Because you say that the change is going to be very slow. And on the other hand, the change. I, ha I have studies on economy, and I want to put it in my vision. Will income be reduced in half of the income of all the countries, of all that will be on the average of the earth will not be that ex affected, and those that are at the streams will be much more affected? Could you really tell me how this is going to happen? I don't know how or when, but maybe it could happen. That is my question. OK, uh, we'll give the floor. Creo I, I think the vision here is that we have a win-win way out. Uh, and the alternative is not that we have a big growth, a sustainable growth, without green components. So it's, a, it's the opposite. Without protecting nature and the environment, I think growth will not contain, and uh, so it, it will not sustain. It will uh, not continue, um, and that's the reason why we are trying to find an integrated approach, which gives, let's say, the entry points for win-win solutions. So the third question. Buenos días a todos. Mi nombre es Javier Martínez. Good morning to all of you. I, I work at the University of San Luis Potosí here in Mexico. I am Mr. Garcia. I am quite aware and certain because there are studies that prove it, the lack of legitimacy in governments makes them use populist policies. And they have a negative ap ap as aspect because we have more and more population worldwide, uh, but we never know who is demanding those services. So we are saying that we have to give more services, but you are not uh, considering that populations are becoming larger. From all those m million people, there are a lot of people that are in the countries with more inequality. So taking advantage of this forum, why don't we promote first in the governments of the OECD countries base distribution and income precisely in giving a better quality of life by the population growth? King. I'll pick up on one. I, I get very uncomfortable whenever I hear anyone say growth is bad or growth is good. Growth has become, we, we need to, it's become this mantra that if we purely look at it as growth for its own sake, 
we're going to get into the sort of mess that we've been talking about today. The sooner we start talking about what precisely it is we want to grow and why, so yes, good jobs, yes, good food so people can feed themselves, but not growth for its own sake. We have to put growth back in its box as one of many levers to good lives. So we shouldn't be talking about actually win-win scenarios because that puts growth and the economy in and of itself on a par with good lives and the environment. Good growth in the right circumstances and fairly distributed can be a good mechanism for those good lives, but it is not a goal in and of itself. So the sooner we kick out GDP, which is you know, orientated to consumption, blind to distribution, and actually really focus on those drivers of our fundamental well-being, our fundamental human needs, start from that rather than this idea of having to make some sort of compromise with the devil and say, oh, it's okay, we can have sustainability with growth at the same time time. That's a silly conversation to have. We need to focus on what it is our communities and our planet needs first and foremost. And it comes back to the, one of the questions that was on the screen around consumerism, which I thought was really important. And it, to me, actually, it's been a real shame we haven't spoken enough over the last few days about this push to consumerism, because just as growth per se is a false satisfier, so would someone like Manfred Max Neef say that consumerism is a false satisfier. So again, that's why I think meetings like this that are focusing on what it is that really helps us make good lives, what is a real ingredients to strong, cohesive, vibrant, enjoyable communities, the sooner we get back to those first principles rather than trying to wedge in other objectives that are pushed by vested interests, and I think the fossil fuel example you need to look no further than the strength of vested interests. That's why these, these sort of meetings are so very important. So go back, going back to square one, what is it that drives our fundamental human needs? Let's build from that, rather than trying to wedge in all these other priorities that are a diversion and potentially really, as we're seeing already, really dangerous diversion. David. I wanted to address a little bit the question coming from the journalist to, together with the, with the other two. And I, I think the challenges that we're seeing are coming rapidly and are going to have a tremendous impact. Um, you know, the, the cod fishery I illustrated is only a small example of what can happen if we don't address our overuse of the planet's resources, including climate change. You know, we saw with Professor Sakran's comments, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. That's an incredibly productive place for fishing and shrimp and food. And so our other activities are, are killing that to try to grow corn and other products further up in the US. Really serious issues, and you can find these globally, worldwide. Uh, particularly the impact of climate change on arable land. It's changing today as we speak, including in Canada really, really serious. I think the issue is we actually have models that show we can make the right kind of change. We have good information. The models show where people are involved and they're part of the decision making, you're far more likely to succeed. Uh, on climate change, for example, the city of Tokyo has a cap and trade program. The province of British Columbia, that's like a state in Canada, has a carbon tax. Ontario and Quebec, uh, huge industrial societies, have cap and trade programs. The world doesn't. So I, I think the issue is, can we take all these great examples and find a way to make the action far more rapid? And if we do that, then we will have a society that is more likely to be inclusive, have shared prosperity, and meet our environmental challenges. But if we don't do that, we're going to see increasing inequity, very serious environmental problems, um, and, and you know, mass migrations of refugees and really, really serious consequences. And the, the, the challenge is taking what we know, taking the statistics, taking the good examples, and creating the will to act on a massive scale, which is what Paris is about. Um, and I hope Helen is right. I, I hope it's a good platform for that kind of action. That's the challenge as I see it. Okay. Hello. 
Uh, thanks very much, uh, Walter. And just to build on that, and in terms of some of the, the questions that were asked, it's very, very clear that um, if we continue on a pathway to degrade the environment, to lose soil, to uh, continue with uh, climate change, we will result in a dead planet. And there are no jobs, there's no profit, there's no growth on a dead planet. So the alternative is not that we can have a prosperous economy, but degrade the environment. We must be able to achieve both together. And increasingly, there's evidence from business, from countries, from states, from cities, from individuals, that we can have both economic growth and climate action and a sustainable environment together. I think the challenge we have is that, as Julia mentioned before, there is this perception that continues with many, many people and many politicians that it, tackling the environment will be a break on development. It won't. If you leave the environment to degrade, that will be the break on development. It will not be sustainable. So we we have the evidence, it's starting to build. What we need is to take this data, this evidence, this analysis, these examples, and get them out there. So this is, again, bringing back the, the ideas of having the indicators, the data, the information, communicating them well through the press, through education, uh, bringing that evidence to light to enable the change that we need. I think, um, I think with that, I would like to close this panel. Um, the panel discussion was extremely rich, and I think it started slightly pessimistic, but at the end we had a more, much more encouraging view to the future. So we need good information, we need engaged citizens, and we have forward-looking, we have to have forward-looking leaders. And if the leaders are not forward-looking, then we are as they looking for the citizens who are informed. That brings us to the question of education and uh, better communication of statistics, knowledge, and all of that. And this is all about the conference, the series of conferences of transforming policies, changing lives. Thank you very much, and a big applause to the panel.